So we're going to have a quick look through the, the risk warning screens here before we kick off with the actual webinar. Any questions at all, please send them through the, the chat or Q&A boxes there and I'm happy to give my take on uh, any particular market you wanted to look at, setups that you were looking at, general questions. Happy to discuss it all. The webinar is going to take about half an hour and we're going to cover the major indices, currencies and commodities that uh, are some of the more popular instruments for CMC Markets clients. Well, there's quite a lot going on this week, actually. Um, as if it wasn't a fun enough end to last week, um, you know, we talked about the, the ECB meeting as being an important one. Uh, we'd said that uh, probably there wasn't going to be any action taken, but there was going to be some sort of dovish commentary. What we nor, nor many suspected was quite how dovish it would be. Um, essentially, a fairly overt uh, statement saying that there is going to be more done at the December meeting. That's at least how the market has taken it anyway. And uh, even though the exact wording was a little bit more muddled, it was still fairly overt. And I think there would be definitely confusion and a fair amount of disappointment were the ECB not at least going to do something at the December meeting, which would you know, potentially be, since it was discussed at this last meeting, rather than the um, yeah, like I hadn't done in previous meetings, was a cut to the deposit rate. So what we're talking about is, let's pull up the old uh, Euro US dollar chart. Um, fairly spectacular drop here in the in the Euro. Um, not easy, not not difficult to guess which day it was in which uh, Mr. Draghi held his press conference. I believe over 200 pips that day. Um, certainly in that vicinity, quite a big drop and through some pretty key support levels to my mind for the, for the Euro. Definitely a game-changing press conference. Um, obviously the following day, we had a little continuation of the move. Um, Euro largely just a continuation of the, the ECB announcement, um, but the markets, if we have a quick switch over and just get a general feel for what's been happening in the last few days. Jump over to the uh, the German DAX is probably the most prominent example. Big breakout of this consolidation area, some really strong moves on Thursday and Friday, following almost nothing happening the rest of the week. ECB and on Friday, China announced a cut to its interest rates and a cut to its bank reserve ratio. So just generally stimulus being hinted at by the ECB and actually introduced by the People's Bank of China. <clears throat> um, so. This week, still central banks in focus, unfortunately. Um, you know, at least we know where to look. At least we know where the, you know, the source of the directional moves are coming from. Um, it's really very central bank related. So on Wednesday is really the uh, the big one because that's when the Federal Reserve meet, and um, then uh, also on late Thursday slash early Friday, depending on where you are. Uh, we've got the the Bank of Japan, so that there, there is some some speculation that there could be some extra stimulus announced from the Bank of Japan for the first time in quite a while. Um, it's been played down a bit in Japanese media overnight. My suspicion is probably they're not going to do anything. One of the simple reasons for that is the Bank of Japan already own about half of the net issuance of uh, JCBs, uh, JJB, sorry. Um, so. That you know, they basically own half of the Japanese government bond market. So how much more can they really buy? Already at the current pace of buying, they're going to start running into troubles um, of actually being able to buy their quota of bonds because they're just they're just cannibalising the whole market. Um, it doesn't seem sustainable to me, and I think probably the Bank of Japan are aware of that, but they obviously don't want to kind of give that away um, for fear that people will just start flooding out of the market. So. Probably an outside chance, I would say, of the um, Bank of Japan doing anything. I guess while we're talking about that, we could have a little skip over to um, the dollar yen chart. Dollar yen's been a really great sideways market we've been mentioning for the past few weeks in these webinars. Signs that maybe a breakout's about to take place, been capped by the RSI resistance at the sort of 63 type level. We did get a break through this sort of intraday, uh, sorry, um, sort of intra-channel resistance around 
this, this one here, it's that August 31st peak that we really need to close above, which we didn't quite manage on um, on Friday um, to, to conclude that we actually are going to break out to the top side of this range. And surprise, surprise, it's, you know, that, that breakout's probably not going to take place until we're through Wednesday and we know what the Federal Reserve's going to do. So on that front, um, I think most likely <clears throat> the Fed aren't going to do anything. Two simple reasons, really. They're, they're, they haven't signaled that they're going to do anything as of yet, so it would be, you know, it would be a very uh, badly signaled move if they were to hike in August. No one really expects it, and there's not a press conference. So if they did do it, they wouldn't be able to explain it. So it's not expected, and they wouldn't be able to explain it. So those two together could trigger a fair amount of market volatility, with this, which this Fed has been fairly shy of um, of, trying, of creating. So. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, I don't think anything's going to happen in October. Obviously, again, it comes down to what they say um, in, in the statement. Uh, so, do they really heavily hint that December's on the table, or, or you know, um, or do they suggest that, um, or do they leave it very much unchanged from the previous meeting? That's a distinct possibility. Or do they sort of say that actually conditions have deteriorated a bit, and do they just fully take? maybe December off the table, take a 2015 rate hike off the table. So what's said in that statement will be key as to whether we can see this breakout in dollar-yen and, and also just to a large extent, no, there's breakouts in like the DAX, et cetera. So I think there, you know, there, there, you know, there are some other reports to, to watch out for. Uh, it's the, the U.S. GDP on Thursday. Um, hold on, is there? My mind has escaped me as to whether it's the UK. Oh, yeah, UK GDP tomorrow. Yep, thought it was. And then well, tomorrow's quite a big one in general. We've also got US consumer confidence and durable goods on Tuesday. None of them, just, none of them game changers, but big reports. Uh, certainly worth watching out for, especially on the currency space. And as I mentioned, there's the CPI for the Eurozone on Friday. Obviously, in the context of what the ECB have just said, um, that they're going to reassess the level of easing or the level of accommodation in December, well, one of the big things they'll be assessing is what inflation is. So that that's the main gauge of inflation. That one will be huge. If, it, if it's another month of deflation, pretty strong chances, I would say, that they're going to do something in December. If it, if it pulls back out of deflation, it's just lowflation again, then I think that probably um, you know there's, there's an increasing chance that um, that they don't do anything in December and maybe just talk again and push things out into the, the following year. So that that will be a definitely a big report to end the week on. And then just by the by for over the weekend, there's Chinese manufacturing PMI. So that Chinese data is always a bit um, uh, a bit um, you know potentially tumultuous in markets. Though obviously. Um, I think one of the interesting things today is why we're, why we're day and why, why why Asian markets were down today is that um, the Premier of China came out over the weekend sort of saying, well, we you know, we never said we're going to do everything we can to, to hit 7%. We're, we're just aiming for a general zone of growth, uh, growth within certain bounds. So that was sort of wasn't taken too well, maybe a suggestion that there isn't massive stimulus coming down the line following this rate cut. So let's get a bit more coordinated here. I think we'll just start with the, the indices since that was just the most interesting market, particularly towards the end of the week. Let's look at the FTSE, which actually was the most underwhelming of them all. Obviously, the UK is not in the Eurozone, <coughs> thankfully. Um, but on this occasion, the, you know, the downside was that the stock market didn't participate in the rally. And so bit of a kind of message to start to look at, but I've tried to get strip it down to everything that I think is relevant. We're below this 200-day moving average, so all these moves higher um, have distinct risk while well below that 200-day moving average um, that a lot of people judge as the, the longer-term trend. So we had this kind of, sort of double bottom type formation. We broke out, retested, looking good from there, big strong move higher. Um, a rising three methods type candlestick formation here also fairly bullish, and we've closed above. So all fairly bullish, but just um, this uh, July 27th low, uh, which was quite a big one for a lot of the indices uh, globally, has capped the advance, also, uh, you know, 
goes alongside with that 6500 level and and we close back down in the vicinity of this 50% level so we haven't really entirely sealed the deal on getting through the 50% Fibonacci level on the, on the UK 100 yet and there is some resistance above from this long term broken trend line which I can scale out and show you on the on the weekly chart I mean it's only connecting by two points but it's two major points and I think a few people were watching it, and there's a, a matching one, I believe it's on the DAX, that um, is it, quite similar, and the, the two may reinforce each other. And then above that, we've got the 61.8% for actually. I mean, given the, the consolidation that we've had here at the 50, I suspect should we get to the 61.8, we'll get through the 200-day moving average, would be my suspicion. Um, probably since since the FTSE has been so dominated by commodities of late, it might take, the, if the Fed hold off on the raising rates um, and commodities rally off that, that commodity rally should be pretty helpful to the FTSE and um, help us get up there. That's a potential scenario. So bullish trend, um, a few bullish, uh, candle patterns, you know, Pushing, uh, you know, just about closing through that resistance in the 50 level, 50% level, um, but still not concretely out of this sideways consolidation. So a risk of a slip back into the consolidation phase. But I think particularly if we hold above this uh, 6 or 309-ish, whatever the low was there, 6306.52. Uh, as long as we hold above that, we're looking pretty good to to push up into the 200-day moving average. I think. The, the overall risk, I'll, I'll switch over to the um, Germany 30 now, but I would say the overall risk factor that we're facing here is that this big sharp rally has been very sharp, and the, you know, that's, a, that's very much a characteristic of a, of a bear market rally. Um, you know, in a bull market, it's normally just a steady grind higher up the stairs and down the elevator, they tend to say, <clears throat> down the lift. So... Um, you know, massive surges to the upside are more something you see during a bear market as corrections to the downtrend versus something you see in a, an up, in a in a nice comfortable uptrend, as we saw, you know, towards the sort of, um, you know, the later part of 2014 when we were just making new record highs every week in the S&P fund and it was just all very steady. Um, we're not quite in the same environment now, obviously. <clears throat> So the risk is that this is just a bear market rally, and when we get much beyond these 200-day moving averages, we're just going to roll over and crash down again. <clears throat> so that's why I definitely suggest you, you know, don't trade directly off the 200-day moving average, but just, just be aware of where we're positioned in terms of that. So uh, all that being said, pretty much, I mean, this is, this is a double bottom pattern, I think, for, for most people's definition in the Germany 30. The neckline is um, conservatively, uh, sorry, sorry, slightly more aggressively, but more obviously, I would say, at the sort of 10-500 level. So I've used the, um, the Fibonacci extension tool, um, extended across here and then up to there, to put a 100% extension of that height of that pattern right back at these, uh, you know, this zone of zone of potential resistance from these peaks. So, um, confluence of of these three peaks resistance plus the objective makes it entirely feasible that we get up there, which is it would be quite a big leg higher from here. Pretty much um, a thousand points. Uh, you know, that 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 projection from current levels, 10,800 up to 11,800. Um, so that would be big, but obviously we've got a few things to get through. Um, again, it's this July 27 peak that you know I mentioned in the in the FTSE. You know, it's the it's the same level here in the in the Germany 30, and uh, we're in the Germany 30, we're we're just below this 200-day moving average, which comes in at just the just about the same level. We've we've pushed through the 50% in the Germany 30 um, of not of so sort of slightly different levels. I'm considering here. This is. Um, this is from the peak, so we're, we're stopping here at the 50 level, just as we are in the FTSE on this longer term level. Um, but just just taking it from this this lower peak, you can see we're we're sitting at the 61.8. So an interesting confluence of a um, of, of resistance here, and I think it's part of why we're stalling out a bit. Perhaps worth leaving that there. <laughs> Uh, 
um, RSI into an over overbought area, so it's, it's out of this kind of bearish range that we were in, characterized by this red area. So risk of a pullback, obviously, from an, from an overbought area, but also signs that we're pushing into a, a bull market, a bull trend. Okay. Let's pop over to the US. So, Again, pretty monumental moves. Um, the U.S. markets had been stronger leading into last week, uh, but you can see that it's just it's, it's the same thing across most global markets. Just no movement whatsoever. I mean, you'll know if you were trading it uh, for the first three days, uh, Friday the previous week, nothing, and then just ECB, China, boom, boom, boom. U.S. also had the um, the good fortunes <coughs> of uh, some pretty strong earnings from. Um, from the tech stocks, most surprising one was Microsoft, which went up 10%. You don't normally expect moves of 10% in Microsoft stock. That's, that's the ultimate example. I mean, not the ultimate, but one of the primary examples of a stable blue chip stock uh, carrying out the sort of move that you would expect in something more like Netflix. <clears throat> you know, high growth momentum stock. So that was surprising to see and, and carried the whole um, whole market higher. I mean, it, it, the gains in Microsoft alone represented about one-fifth of the gains of the, the Dow Jones Industrial Average, so the US 30 that we're looking at here. So we're, we've just peaked above the 200-day moving average, which so obviously in the, the European markets, just a little bit below it. And um, I would characterize the sort of general resistance zone as where we are sitting right now, based on these previous lows from the 7th of May and the 16th of June, uh, right the way up to this little peak <coughs> um, right here, I think, is an, as, as a zone of resistance. And it does tend, tend to sort of correlate with this declining trend line, which I wouldn't put too much stock in. Obviously, you know, we've done this. Um, so it's not like this has been a consistent trend, but still, it, it's, it's an extra factor to, to consider why gains could be limited in this area, and if we push through that area, uh, why the gains could get sustained. The question I've just got through is, are we going to see a downtown in US 30? Well, I certainly wish I knew. Um, it, it, it's, I guess it's a similar answer to um, you know, what I said to more broadly is that uh, the risk is for all these global indices is this is a bear market rally and that we roll over before we get to the all-time peaks. Uh, and so obviously that's the peak of the market here whenever it was, the 18th of May, 19th of May. So, as, you know, anywhere below there, you know, we could, you know, we can still get all the way up to that peak. And, and roll over, and um, you know it, it wouldn't be like you know we would be into the territory of a new uptrend. And obviously, even that rule doesn't particularly hold. You can get a, a false break higher and then roll over. So it depends on the time frame from which you're trading and how much risk you're willing to tolerate. Um, this area I'm highlighting is a potential area that in which the market could roll over. I think if we get through there. Uh, we probably do push somewhere up in towards the, the record highs. I would imagine we've got to see a bigger correction uh, before we get there. Um, there's going to be a lot of people that were very rattled during this downturn, and um, it, it's going to be difficult to overcome those levels. So I would imagine that we fall off to some decent extent and recover before turning up to new highs, if, if indeed we ever do so. So I think, you know, on the, on the short-term basis, the trend is strongly higher, and it's, you know, it's, it's risky selling into it. <clears throat> um, but, you know, but look for signs of weakness in these, these key areas, and uh, just be distinctly aware that it's not an outright bull market right now. We certainly could roll over any time. Okay, let's, uh, if we're all good there, let's um, switch across to um, the commodity market. We started the day a bit sluggish. We've actually pulled, off, pulled up a bit now. Um, <clears throat> 
haven't caught anything particularly across the wires as to why copper's jumped. It was above about 0.2 earlier. Now it's up about 1%. <clears throat> um, best starting ourselves with this weekly chart in copper. So this is a sort of fairly rough looking down channel. <laughs> down channel that we have in, uh, in copper and uh, what we're trying to do at the moment is push off the bottom of this uh, this channel now so far we sort of suggest they have done so a bit of a double bottom potentially setting up here which I've been mentioning since that first week um, and now what's happening is that we're grinding into this this declining trend line here you can see it better on the weekly chart uh, on the daily chart sorry you can see we've had quite a few touches now. Why are we on fifth? One, two, three, four, five, five, yeah. So, you know, a sixth, um, a sixth touch, fifth or sixth touch really often uh, precedes a, a break. Because, uh, yes, the, the line is getting stronger the number of breaks there is, um, but it just means that when, the, you know, eventually when there is a break, it's, it's that, more, that much more significant. And the line can't hold it that many times. So I think probably the option here is to, to look for that break of that declining trend line because you need a bit of confirmation because still we are below this 200-day moving average and, um, you know, we failed to even take out this um, this uh, 17th of September peak yet. So until we get above there, put in what is something along the lines of a double bottom, break this declining trend line would be the first sign, break of the double bottom neckline at 250 would be the next sign that we're pushing higher in copper. Uh, just mentioned copper, I think, because um, because of the moves today. Gold. You know, where th this this should look pretty different by the end of this week. I would imagine, you know, gold is um, pretty orientated around what the Fed's doing at the moment. You know, obviously longer term, looking fairly weak on the idea that um, the <clears throat> the Fed is going to raise rates and people won't really want precious metals anymore. But obviously broken this declining trend line, which is quite significant, I think, and still looking for the possibility of getting up to this this longer term resistance level up here at the sort of two uh, two ninety just shade uh, sorry so two um, two two thirty kind of area. So if you could sort of look through what's going on in this chart at the moment. Um, so this would have been a very sort of aggressive bounce, which we, we got some signs of, but it was never really going to happen. We got just above this resistance. If we just popped higher off there, that would have been a real acceleration of the trend. Gold doesn't typically act that way. It tends to be a bit more wide ranging. And uh, you know, and then it'll suddenly blast higher, but then it'll drift higher, drift down into a range again. Um, so it's sometimes it's difficult to catch it. You kind of need to pick these. Um, pick these breakout areas when they first happen, you know, this, the, the second touch of the break area often doesn't work. So we've, we've, you know, we failed at the first one. We're coming down to the second peak here from the 24th of, uh, of September. And we've come off just there around the 1160 area, sort of something along the lines of a long-legged doji candlestick there. Basically, just showing a lot of indecision around this 200-day moving average. Um, so what we're looking for is kind of, you know, w w you know, the nicest trends are when you have higher high, higher low, which ends at the previous higher uh, the previous high. You know, high drops down to the peak again, that kind of thing. Um, I think it's, uh, you know. No one really expects the Fed to do anything, and so we could get a bounce in gold, but I'm not sure how far it's going to get sustained because it's kind of already baked in that they're, they're not going to do anything. And if they keep signaling that they want to do something and December's still on the table, if they keep signaling that, then I think we could actually eventually see a drop in gold back down towards the bottom of the, the channel. So keep an eye on this, this, this kind of area. Um, 
potentially the, the, the trend line, they get where it last touched the trend line is some kind of support, but actually the, the broken trend line uh, would, co you know, depending on when we get there, could end up matching this rising channel base as well. So that would be an opportunity once we get down there. Here is a slightly higher risk opportunity, but obviously that this is where we sit before the Fed. So, you know, if you are trading off this support area, you know, you're trading off the support, you're before a big event, um, you just got to be aware that the support can break or can hold, you know, you can't really predict it before the event. You can just make some summations. So the, uh, what's the, I believe I looked at WTI this time around, um, just because I thought this was this was pretty pretty interesting here. We basically this was a really solid area of support for WTI. It was basically a 45 level in the RSI, and that broke. Um, and we proceeded to go down and touch the bottom of the trend. We had a little false break out of the bottom. Um, so we haven't really, you know, it's a bit hard to kind of draw these kind of trend lines, but depending on how you've drawn this, I don't think we've actually seen a close below the, the channel here. But given the fact that we came off the 200-day moving average and the 50% FIB from the uh, from the peak here in, in, in June, complements of resistance here, and we've just fallen away, and it's starting to look now that actually you know, maybe we're going to break this channel as well. And if we do break this channel, and then secondly, you know, these are the uh, two lows from back in uh, start of the year. This January first January low, it's kind of what we've been dealing with since. You know, that was the massive decline. Put in that low, consolidated, broke a little bit below, made a big bounce, broke a bit further below, and the bounce since has been a bit less convincing. <clears throat> So it does sort of, you know, longer term trend still much very much down in oil and looks like this uh, consolidation might be about to end. Um, the, you know, the, the channel is the first sign. I think uh, the, the, the low from January at, uh, what is it, 43.50 is, um, you know, that's the kind of line in the sand, if you like. Had a lot, had a lot of closes above uh, around the 44 vicinity as well. So a close below 44 would also be more aggressive um, belief that this is going to break lower. Mm -hmm. And we've got a couple of minutes to to go to the end here. So any final cues you might have, just feel free to to let me know. Um, we don't, haven't left a lot of time for the, uh, the currencies, but I will cruise through that. We obviously looked at this Euro chart. <coughs> um, let's, let's cruise up to the weekly chart, which I've been referencing a lot recently. Here you can just most clearly see the triangle. I did actually have a declining line through here for a while, but I think actually this, this uh, 1460 level is really kind of the key one. And we've fallen away from that. Um, shooting star candlestick on the weekly chart and then plummeted the following week below the, the rising trend line here and it's um, it's looking pretty soft for the euro at the moment and um, you know whatever technique you do use to trigger entries in the, in the market you know it, it looks like according to this triangle pattern at least that the the short side would be the um, you know the best side to take those triggers next obvious, uh, obvious area of support is this um, 108 to 108.20 top vicinity from these uh, from these lows in from May and July, um, and so that would get, that would put us in a kind of choppy looking rectangle pattern if we held around there. Um, but you know, trend line broken there, longer term trend line broken there. You know that was a significant move last week. Obviously, it can retrace, um, but I think the fact we closed through there uh, on the week as well as the day um, is a strong bearish sign. Cable also failed at 155 a couple of times. <clears throat> I've been highlighting that this broken rising trend line, which, you know, had we sort of broken above there, successfully retested the RSI there, could, uh, you know, and, and then broken above this declining price trend line would have been a good, 
trigger long, but that just didn't happen. And we had this shooting star, <clears throat> a big daily reversal on the uh, on the ECB Thursday. We had some good UK data <clears throat> on the Thursday, um, but that just got completely eclipsed by the, the ECB action, and so the dollar rose really against the across the board as the main counter to the euro and the. Um, uh, the, the the pound just kind of sunk alongside the other European currencies and other major global currencies. So this trend line is actually, from from looking like it could have broken based on the RSI, has actually held pretty well. And so this is basically a broken long signal, uh, which you know, uh, if you had any trades trading off that break long, obviously you're at a loss now. But opens up some opportunities to the downside now. Quickly over to dollar yen, we've already looked at this briefly as well. <clears throat> um, and I think I did mention that uh, you know we're basically still inside that channel and a break above here looks more likely now, but we need to wait for that really to be more conclusive that uh, we've actually got out of this choppy sideways range for the moment. For the moment, the same tactic that's been working uh, you know, since late August of selling at the top of the range is working. Um, okay, so that's the uh, that's the end of uh, this weekly uh, webinar. The um, the actual recording. Uh, I've just got found another question here in the chat room. I'll answer that, but I'll stop the recording first and um, and then answer that. And uh, whoever wants to stick around, feel free. So for those all those have to leave. Uh, thanks very much for attending, and good luck with trading this week.